we had our first uh, copyright infringement. Uh, really? We got hit with a copyright infringement violation on YouTube uh, a couple weeks ago for our uh, Billy Ilyish uh, video. But uh, they, uh, YouTube basically saw that A, we're not monetized, and B, we had like 23 views, so they basically didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is episode 35, and we are talking about if living on a cruise ship is a good way to retire, how BlackRock feels about the younger generation, and another lightning round to the end. <clears throat> a cruise ship is often a preferred way to vacation for many people, but for some, it's a way of life. According to a recent article in the New, in, according to a recent New York Times article, some, re, some retirees book back-to-back -back cruises into perpetuity and spend the majority of their retirement years on the high seas. Uh, is this a good strategy for retirement, uh, Drew? A good retirement strategy? Um, I, I guess it depends on what your goals for retirement are. I guess I'll come at this from a financial angle. When it comes to retirement, there's a lot of different financial strategies that retirees can benefit from, like dealing with sequencing risk of returns, investing for tax efficiency, maximizing social security, downsizing, and a bunch of others. Um, but selling everything um, but a couple of suitcases and making a cruise ship your home aren't exactly on the short list of, of core retirement strategies that I'd probably recommend. Now, if you've done your due diligence and this is a lifestyle that you want and you, uh, you understand how it'll impact your financial life, your family life, your emotional health, uh, and your overall health, and you're still wanting to go for it, I say go for it. Um, you're retired. You've worked your whole life. Uh, you've made sacrifices. And now it's time to enjoy your golden years uh, the best way that you know how. I say more power to you. Alex. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. I would say that from a monetary standpoint, um, booking, you know, long term cruises uh, is not that cheap, but it's not as expensive as you might think. Um, a, there are actually some cruise ships that you can buy residences on and those are pretty unbelievably expensive actually you know talking like 200 square foot studio apartments for like 300 grand so for something like that i would probably say absolutely not but um you know it, if you worked for 40 years and you saved your money and you don't want to be tied down to a house and you know, you want to spend the last few years of your life, you know, exploring the world and seeing things you've never seen before, rather than mowing a lawn and going to the grocery store over and over again. Why not? You know, you worked hard for it, you saved for it. Sure. I think financially, it's certainly viable. The, the cost of, of spending a week on a cruise ship, multiply that times 52 weeks of the year, compared to the cost of staying in a retirement community, I think you're going to find they're very comparable. Uh, it's just a, really a matter of uh, you know, what, what, what you're looking for in retirement. Yeah. It's not for everybody, though. You have to be in relatively good shape to do it. So retired people generally have more health challenges than, than people who are still working. And you're not going to have the best opportunities for doctors to uh, look out for you. So you, you have to pretty much be in, in, in perfect health for this to work for you. Secondly, is that if you have family, it's really going to be hard for you to to maintain relationships with other people off the ship if your residency is on a cruise ship. Cost-wise, I think it's one option that's available, but so is moving to Ecuador. So uh, for those people who want a little adventure, maybe it's something you do for a few years and then, and then come back home. But uh, in one of the articles I read, there was an 80, 90-year-old woman who's been doing this for a long time, and some gentleman in his late 60s has been doing it for 20 years. So the answer is yes, you can do it, just make sure it's exactly meeting your needs before you pull the trigger. Cruise Market Watch said the average person on board a cruise ship spends two hundred twelve dollars per day. If you if you if you basically take up add up all the expenses and then you divide that by you know the three hundred sixty uh, three hundred sixty five days per year, they're they're at, they're saying that the average person spends two hundred twelve dollars per day aboard a cruise ship in two thousand eighteen which comes out to be about $77,000 per year. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics basically says that people over the age of 65 on average spend about $50,000 a year. So, you know, day-to-day -day living spaces, if you're trying to live, you know, really frugally, then maybe the cruise ship isn't the cheapest uh, way to do that. 
but you're right compared to like a uh um compared to like a uh you know like a senior citizens uh community or something like that the the, the costs are probably comparable um again yeah and then joe brought up by point two but the biggest issue that you're going to have is health care uh, ex especially for medicare and health insurance reasons is because a lot of time insurance health insurance companies will not uh cover your medical expenses if you're more than six uh, I think six hours away from like a, a U.S. Uh, healthcare facility or something like that. It's so there's a lot of court. maritime uh, regulations for insurance companies on when they will cover uh, your health and care uh, health insurance expenses. So if you're, you know, if you're a, if you're a day away from a U.S. healthcare facility, um, you'll probably not be covered by Medicare. So that that's a big uh, big issue. Also, you know, said I, I don't know. You know, I don't know if the best doctors in the world want to be uh, want to be working uh, 24 seven on a cruise ship. So that would be something to consider, too. And I imagine that they're they're basically uh, general practice doctors. So if you've got special uh, special issues, um, you know, you're probably going to be want to sticking around a, a legitimate uh, health care facility. I will say, though, uh, just before this goes on too long, is that the storyline uh, storyline cruise company, I guess, is is there, that's going to launch in 2024 will actually let you buy you know houses and apartments and stuff aboard a cruise ship uh for as low as four hundred thousand dollars and like alex said you know it's going to be small though i mean it's like a couple hundred square feet and uh and then basically they're going to charge you a seventy thousand dollar per year uh living um like or sixty five uh sixty five thousand dollar per year living fee that can go up to $200,000 per year. So, I mean, you're not really saving a lot of money on this. You're basically just choosing to, to travel the world uh, on a cruise ship instead of owning, you know, a piece of like a house or something in, in the United States. So, yeah, we gotta be careful because there's a lot of issues with this, you know, is that you own real estate on a depreciable, de depreciating asset. And I don't know what happens if, you know, you get one of the, you know, I'm just making stuff up here, but what happens if it hits an iceberg? Um, you know, what happens to your property? It's never that happened. Point? That's never We're, happened. To, that doesn't say shit. Yeah. I don't think it's just limited to retirees. Uh, I know a lot of uh, our peers, um, Tom and Alex, they work remotely. Um, I'd be all for this. If I had a remote job, I might spend a couple of years on a cruise ship. Sounds yeah, great. that's a thing. A couple of years, though. I mean, I don't think you want to just like give it up and, you know, your life entirely. No, but I could, I could do it without having any place to come home to. I'd be willing to not have a house or an apartment and basically just make my the cruise ship my residence for that time yeah if you're young single want to travel and you can work from anywhere why not good idea mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you're making less than what it costs to stay on the ship then you might have a problem but my my my, my dad his his uh his part-time job is to uh get up every morning have a cup of coffee then sit down and find the deals on on cruise ships and they live about less than an hour and a half away from a port of call in New Orleans. And he gets incredible deals all the time as people drop out of uh, um, um, the, the ship manifest. He'll, he'll, he can get on there for a week for six or seven hundred dollars per person, which it's actually cheaper to live on a cruise ship than it is to live at home. Now, those are those are, you know, uh, black swan events, but they happen in often enough to where somebody had a small apartment and had access to uh, to a cruise ship they probably could spend quite a bit of the year on a cruise ship and uh, and, and and basically just use their apartment in case they don't <clears throat> yeah that the the new york times article i referenced uh you know that's basically what the couple was doing and they bought a condo in fort lauderdale specifically so they could just do their laundry and wait for the next cruise ship <laughs> But then the pandemic hit and they ended up living in it. So I know I guess it worked out for them because they're back on it now. So, <clears throat> all right, moving on. So we'll do the uh, the devil's advocate round. <laughs> and today, Joe is the uh, devil's advocate because he has harsh things to say about millennials. And uh, so uh, BlackRock President Rob Capito told a conference in Austin, Texas, that Inflation and high gas prices are forcing a generation of entitled younger Americans to learn the pain of not being able to buy things at the store. Uh, he went on to say that for the first time, this generation is going 
uh, to go into a store and not be able to get what they want and instructed people to put on their seatbelts because this is something that we haven't seen before. Uh, do you agree, uh, Drew? You want me to kick it off? <clears throat> sure. I think, um, I think he's right about how we need to be prepared for change and how this scarcity squeeze might result in fewer and or more expensive available goods. But I disagree and almost offended with how he directs this only at the millennial generation. It's almost like he's saying the silent generation, the baby boomers and Gen X will be totally fine from this change, but the millennials will just lay down and die because they're entitled and they haven't had to sacrifice anything in their lives. Now, maybe millennials haven't had to sacrifice as much as other generations, but it, I don't think it's been a cakewalk for them. Um, millennials had to deal with 9-11. They fought through two wars because of, uh, because of this in Afghanistan and Iraq, Afghanistan being the longest war in US history. Uh, they entered the job market in the wake of the 08, 09 Great Recession. They've had to deal with COVID and record high inflation um, while trying to get an economic foothold. So to heck with you, millennials haven't had to sacrifice much. Um, I think that the scarcity squeeze is going to affect everybody equally. Now, different generations might react to it differently. I'm not saying that the younger generations aren't gonna, uh, there's not gonna be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth, but um, ultimately I think um, everyone will suffer and everyone will adapt. Like everything, it's going to be bad for a while, and then it's going to get better. Uh, Joe, why don't you uh, why don't you give us the uh, devil's advocate opinion, which I think is also your opinion. <laughs> there was a book that was written uh, back in the early '90s called Generations, where the historians theorized that there are only four distinct personality or generation personalities. So, per Generation A gives birth to generation B, gives birth to generation C, gives birth to generation D. D gives birth to A and the whole pattern starts over again. The millennials are considered to be very similar in terms of their generational personality as the, the Bob Hope generation who fought World War II. One of the things that the Bob Hope generation uh, experienced was people who are younger than their generation and people that are older than generation tended to treat them with kid gloves. They did everything they possibly could to um, uh, minimize the, the, uh, um, the negativities of the depression, the negativities of World War II. Uh, but to their credit, the Bob Hope generation actually went off to war and came back uh, victoriously. And for the rest of their lives, the, uh, the, the nation gave them the GI Bill, um, gave them suburbs, gave them um, you know, home appliances, and essentially that particular generation are the folks that are living in Sun City, Arizona, and retirement communities all throughout the South that caters specifically to their generation. The millennials have enjoyed similar generational support from people who are older than they are, and I think we're going to find that when the other generations coming up are going to treat them with the same deference. We've got a situation now where during the pandemic, a third of millennials uh, are clinically depressed uh, from one of the articles that I read. I don't know just how much experience they have handling generational strife because it's not like they, they, they went through a whole lot. I guess we could say the pandemic was difficult. But for a lot of folks, difficulty with staying at home playing video games or, or trading stocks online and, uh, uh, and, and, and watching movies on Netflix and getting paid for it from the government. So it seems like folks have done a, a remarkable job of trying to diminish the difficulties. As I was speaking with Tom earlier today is that I, I'm starting to experience what we consider like the dark ages of our time. And what I mean by that, by that is that for the first time in my lifetime, we're actually seeing a decline in, in, uh, in lifestyle. Whereas before you could get on Amazon and, and pretty much order whatever you want. And even our mountain residencies up here in Montana, we can have stuff delivered to our front door within two days. I've been, I was traveling and there was almost a thousand flights that were canceled for a variety of different reasons. Uh, you go to the stores and they're, they're, they're void of things that you just took for granted you could pick up before. 
Now you actually have to strategically shop to get the things that you need. This is just the beginning. If, uh, if we continue on this thing, there's going to be some societal rumblings. And I think that the millennials are going to be uniquely um, frustrated because they've never actually gone through anything similar in the past. Alex. Well, I'll start this off by saying that um, most generations who come along think the generations that come after are soft, entitled, spoiled, and lazy. That's been the case basically since there have been human beings on this planet. And then the ones that get called entitled and spoiled and lazy go on to think the exact same things about the ones that come later on. Um, in, in general, I think, you know, Larry Fink and Rob Capito are correct in a factual sense. Like, yes, globalization is, which is what he was talking about. Globalization is winding down, going back to more regional or national economies. And it's going to take several years at least for supply chains to, uh, to, I guess, re-coalesce in whatever new form they're eventually going to take. And that's going to mean pain. Um, but kind of like Drew was saying, I am, I mean, I think it's kind of absurd to me that, you know, the people who created the, uh, the, the, uh, participation trophies and handed them out to their millennial kids are complaining that millennials all got participation trophies. Um, number two, it's it, pretty much exactly what Drew was saying earlier. It's millennials have gone through 9-11. They went through the financial crisis right as they were starting their careers. Um, then 10 years of the worst economic recovery after a recession in American history, followed by COVID crushing the economy and destroying global supply chains, leading to shortages and inflation like we haven't seen since the 1970s. To suggest that millennials have not experienced problems economically is to be completely, I guess, out of touch in, in my opinion. You know, these are millionaires, billionaires telling people that they need to tighten their belts, who made millions and billions of dollars exploiting the global financial and trade systems. Now that they're going away, they, uh, you know, they're telling people that people who have already been hammered really with two serious financial and economic crises in 15 years have to learn how to tighten their belts. You know, millennials, I think, are, are not as ridiculous as people think they are. I mean, this is the generation that went through those things that has tried to make a go of it in an age where many companies are trying to hire them on, you know, gig deals or, you know, before and right after the financial crisis, they were talking about and in, in employing these people with, you know, unpaid internships. I mean, can you even imagine having to go to work for nothing? You know, I think I think millennials are a lot more experienced in dealing with economic problems than people give them credit for. So I'll just piggyback on basically what Alex, because I agree with uh, Alex and Drew for the most part. And uh, basically, I'll say two things. One is that yeah, during you know the pandemic, well, the pandemic, you know, Joe's right. The pandemic wasn't that hard. It was basically staying at home for a lot of people. The stock trading, you know, is playing video games. You're locked in your house, but things weren't you know historically that bad but um i guess what i'll say though is that when i when i was you know scrolling through facebook or whatever you know a lot of the complaining i saw was not just specifically millennials i mean it ran the gamut is like really old people we got young people middle-aged people everybody had their gripes about what was going on everybody was having a temper tantrum at the store i showed up at uh super one a couple times and I saw two altercations during the pandemic, like during the height of the pandemic, when everybody's mass and they only let so many people in the store. And both of those were from, from middle-aged uh, people. And I never saw one where anybody younger than myself was, uh, was getting arrested um, by, the, uh, by the Whitefish police here in, uh, in Montana. Not, but that, that, that's, that's, you know, that's just an anecdotal story. That's not representative of, uh, of the nation. Um, but but by and large, I think that number one, that younger generations, millennials, uh, Gen X or Z or whatever it is uh, that's below us, is more resilient because the ones, the resilient ones, are the ones that you don't see uh, on YouTube. They're not like the influencers and you know the, the basically where you see a lot of these media articles come from. Is like a lot of the ones I know, they they own chickens, they have gardens, and uh, you know they they're they're uh, they're very entrepreneurial 
uh, innovative people. And uh, when hard times come, they don't just roll over and, uh, and just die. I mean, they're, they're very uh, resourceful people. Uh, secondly, or I guess my next point is, is that I see a lot of people adapting to this. And again, it's not just the younger generations. I see people who are in their retirement years who basically sold everything and they live in a van. And I see a lot of that with uh, the younger generations. I see people like on, uh, you know, when I take uh, some time off and I'm downtown, I see there's a guy in Whitefish who's, you know, in his late 20s, early 30s, who basically just works out of his van uh, with the door open in the summertime in downtown Whitefish. And that's, that's, you know, I'm assuming that's what he, I mean, he's there all the time. So I'm assuming that's where he lives at this point. And if you go down to Blankenship Bridge in the North Fork, there's a ton of those little uh, uh, sprinter vans sitting down there where people have chosen to, you know, sell their house and basically just live and work out of their van with their, uh, with their Wi-Fi connection. So I think people are more prepared to do without than, uh, than Rob uh, uh, Capito and the people at BlackRock are anticipating. Um, so I guess those are my two points. <laughs> I just think it's kind of funny how you literally said they're, they're living in, in vans down by the river and that's, yeah. that's what's desirable now before, you know, the old SNL skit, that was what you didn't want. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you know, you, you've made it if you can yep. live in a van down by the river. Exactly. <clears throat> well, I, I, I certainly hope you're all correct. Um, we've, we've got a president who is going to go ahead and extend the, uh, the interest payments on taxpayer backed student loans once again, uh, for another 90 days. What is this, two years running where uh, we have extended not paying interest on, on taxpayer-backed student loans? And I can tell you that half of the, the millennials that I've talked to who have student loans, they their strategy is just wait until they're finally forgiven. And, uh, and this last pandemic we went through, we, we have basically trained a third of the workforce that if things get really, really bad, the government will just send you checks that uh, or whatever, anything time something gets really, really hard, we can expect the federal government to step in and, and minimize the blow. I hope that we that, that uh, all generations have the resiliency to deal with difficulty because it'll mean getting through the difficulty will go a lot faster and, and, and a lot less painful. But I, I don't think that our current society has done a really good job of equipping any generation for difficulties. Instead, we we basically have told them, just elect us, and we'll, we will minimize the difficulties of any hardships that are coming down the pike. And I think that uh, many of our leaders are their, their their mouths are writing checks that their bodies can't cash. We'll move on to the uh, to the lightning round. So last week, Donald Trump released an official presidential statement about a hole in one he achieved while playing golf with uh, Ernie Els, who is a professional golfer. The statement read, many people are asking, so I'll give it to you now. It's 100% true. It took place at the Trump International Gold Club in West Palm Beach, Florida on the seventh hole, which is playing about 181 yards into a slight wind. Uh, if you were a former president, would you release an official statement about your hole in one using a, th you know, through a, through official means, or do you think this was, uh, this was inappropriate? Uh, Drew. N no, I wouldn't if I was uh, the president, but it's a very Trump thing to do. Um, honestly, I think it'd be weirder if he didn't put out an official statement, uh, you know, boasting about his, his hole in one. Alex? Absolutely. Yeah, I would. Why not? <laughs> uh, Joe? I, uh, I'm not old enough to play golf, so I, I, I really don't understand uh, uh, you know, why I'd have to tell the world I got a hole in one. If I was president, no, I would not uh, use <laughs> a, official channels to let the rest of the world know. Uh, I absolutely would if I got a hole in one, and I might even consider just you know e-blasting uh, everybody at Coco Enterprises uh, database here, just let them know too. So yep. if it ever happens, you know, expect an email from me. Fire up the emergency alert system. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, we'll do a uh, farm to markets uh, topic on it. Um, it still doesn't compare to uh, was it Kim Il? Kim, was it Kim Jong Il or Kim yeah. Il Sung who got eleven holes in one on his first first round ever playing golf? Huh. Um, it's weird how that happens. In those yeah, things. weird. Yeah, strange. But yeah, I think Trump has a long way to go. Same day he invented the burrito, right? Yes. <laughs> wasn't, well, wasn't he the burrito bowl? Wasn't that the... I can't remember. Okay. <laughs>
All right, uh, in Japan, the platonic companionship market is becoming uh, ever more the ever more established as people who don't want to go to the movies or dinner alone can rent a friend for an hourly rate to go with them. Uh, do you see potential in this industry, uh, Drew? Yeah, I, I see potential. I, I support free market economies. If there are two or more consenting people willing to rent or be rented, um, go for it. None of my business. I think it's great. Alex? Um, I'm sure it's going to get some use, uh, especially hearing some of the stories about social isolation in places like East Asia. I wouldn't use it, but I wouldn't bet against it either. You know, it, it, it already exists. You know, the, the earlier piece we had on about retiring on a, on a cruise ship, there are actually paid gentlemen who are retired known as dance hosts. And their whole purpose of being on the cruise ship is to be available to dance with single women. So um, yes, the answer is not only is it possible, it's actually happening today. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. I don't think it's gonna be a, I don't think it's gonna blow up and be like the next uh, Facebook of uh, internet platforms. I went like in Japan, I've heard in Japan, it's pretty legitimate. I mean, is that uh, people use it and it's pretty good. I went on to uh, rent a friend uh, USA here and you know for, for whitefish and I have to say I am not going to be joining uh, anytime soon um, so that's all I'll say actually about that. people using it what's that I, I don't know I can't I mean they they seem legit it said from like summers whitefish Kalispell and these people want to be your friend but okay I don't know I, I just I just don't see it taking off that's all I'm gonna say <clears throat> All right, last topic. Uh, celebrities like Elon Musk and Kylie Jenner have given their children some interesting names. Uh, for instance, Elon Musk named one of his children A A E A twelve. What they call they call him X is what they what they call the uh, their son. And uh, Kylie Jenner named her son Wolf, but has reportedly dropped the name as it does not fit him. Uh, was their quote. So I guess my question is that if you were a celebrity. What would you name your child? Am I, am I uh, a successful enough celebrity that my child never has to worry about getting a job? Sure, it's whatever you want. You can be okay. a bigger celebrity as you I'd want. Name him a uh, Ty Royal Smoochie Wallace. Okay. All right, uh, Alex. Uh, I would. I mean, I would just give him a normal name. Um, I, I, th I think either weird names in general or weird spellings of otherwise normal names. To me, they seem like the parents are attention seeking or are just dumb. So I don't want to be either one of those. To follow that, uh, Joe, what would you name your celebrity child? <clears throat> what, what, whatever Mrs. Coco would allow. <laughs> All right. Whatever made mustard, just like the first batch of kids I had. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I, I was trying. Know, to, I was trying to go with you know Frank Zappa's lead and name my son Dweezil and my daughter Moonbeam, but uh, it didn't pass muster with uh, Mrs. Coco. That makes sense. If I was like a like a Bill Gross type of celebrity, who's a big uh, big bond trader and is uh, pretty famous in the financial world, I guess I'd name my kid either my kids uh, either Contango or Backwardation, <laughs> and then that people would know that uh, I had something to do with uh, finance, or they just wouldn't understand it. So. <laughs> Uh, those would be my two uh, two picks if I would say uh, famous Bond trader. <clears throat> All right, that's it for uh, episode uh, 35. Uh, we'll see you next week.